So, uh, two quick things. One, uh, Amy, uh, wonderful Amy you saw yesterday, is going to be bringing us through lightning talks and ushering people on and ushering people off. Uh, but first up, we've got three pre-recorded lightning talks. So we've got Adam with What's New in Video.js, Joey with Generative AI Codex, a modest proposal in three minutes. That's going to be impressive, modest, yeah. Uh, and Garrett with Debugging Video Like a DJ. So we'll put those three on the screen, and then Amy will take it from there. Thank you. Oh, hey. Didn't see you there. Have you heard about Video.js? <laughs> of course you have. Well, let's talk. What's new with Video.js, you ask? Lots. For starters, we've added support for the newest Dash and HLS tags, such as content steering. We've had some UI improvements, developer experience improvements, and expanded our metadata support. For example, we now have full date range support for HLS. We also now support event stream tags for Dash, and we parse e-message data in fragmented MP4s. Our open source community is very important to us, and we rely on all of you to develop a lot of these cool new features that I'm talking about today. We've added an on request and on response API that allows you to intercept and manipulate all network requests through all phases of playback. We've also added some expanded TypeScript support for those of you who prefer to develop in TypeScript. Video.js team and the open source community also provide a ton of plugins that further expand the feature set, such as a plugin for CMCD support. We've also had a lot of UI improvements lately too, such as SVG icon support, improved caption positioning support, specifically for 608 captions, numerous additional language translations, and also full support for document picture in picture. One of the features I'm most excited about is content steering. This provides a content creator granular control over where the end user fetches segments and data from and can be informed by quality of experience metrics provided by the end user. Well, it's been nice talking with you, but as you can see, I've got a very busy day ahead of me, so I better get to work. Hi everybody, this is a lightning talk, so we're gonna go super, super fast. I'm Joey Parrish. I'm probably best known as the creator of the Demuxed AI drinking game, which I am about to win. If memory serves me correctly, Phil Clough did a talk a year or two back about descriptive captions. At the time, I wondered, exactly how descriptive are descriptive captions? But we'll come back to that. Fast forward a bit, and now AI has become the new blockchain. And of course, like blockchain before it, AI instantly solved all our problems forever without any drawbacks or cause for concern. But Codex, somehow Codex were not a solved problem. So my friend and I started experimenting. First, we invented a blockchain video codec, but the SEC later deemed it to be an unlicensed security. So next we turn to Stable Diffusion. Stable Diffusion is amazing. It starts with a bunch of noise and then progressively uh, something, something dark wizard magic, I assume, and then you get an image. During our experiments, my friend described Stable Diffusion like this. What a delightful hammer. What things could we turn into nails? I think we can nail video, folks. So here's my proposal for the Generative AI Codec, or GAC, which is also the noise many of you will make when you hear the details. And although we never succeeded in an end-to-end -end codec, we did create primitive versions of all of the tools that would make up an actual decoder. So here's how GAC is shaping up. Descriptive captions are the actual bitstream format. You have a compression ratio significantly higher than any existing codec. In fact, the compressed size is the same for SD, HD, and UHD streams. 
the decoder architecture itself is Stable Diffusion's text-to-image, which generates keyframes from each caption, and then image-to-image -image with some carefully chosen parameters to animate those frames very, very badly. This decoder requires a GPU with tons of RAM and consists of eight gigabytes of models and code and data. Now, ultimately in our experiments, we were able to decode three seconds of video in only 20 minutes. So experts agree, it's slightly faster than VVC. So what do you think folks? DM me if you want in. Remember, GAC may not be the codec we need, but maybe, just maybe, it's the codec we deserve. Thanks. Hi, I'm Garrett. And if you're like me, you've spent a lot of time debugging video using the JavaScript console web browser. And if you're really like me, you've thought, I'm not wasting enough time and money doing this. I always thought that DJ controllers look cool and debugging video using the browser console wasn't nearly as cool. So I bought one. So let's drop the console logs or something like that. If it wasn't already obvious, I've never used a DJ controller, so everything I say is probably wrong, except play pause. I know that one. Next, we've got these big pads. So let's make them our standard console logs. One for current time, two for buffered ranges, three for seekable ranges, four for resolution. But hold on, these messages are tiny. Let's crank the volume. Now we're logging. Back to those pads, hot cue's gotta mean log once, and loop means loop. Perfect. This crossfader will be our looping interval. Tempo has got to be video playback speed. And the jog wheels can only be seeking. This is by far the uh, most effective type of seeking. Yep, 100% useful. I really don't know what to do with bass and filter, so they're going to change the hue and saturation of the logs. They're the let's get this log party started knobs. All right, hold up. This is a DJ rig. And you can't use a DJ rig without sounds. So if you thought, no, there's no way this can get more useless and annoying than it already is, well, I'm gonna prove you wrong. Now I can only imagine one place to source these sounds. So let's grab some of our favorite parts of our favorite video and save them as short clips. We do that about a hundred more times because I'm really indecisive about what clips to use, even though the audio doesn't end up being great anyway, but I go through this process for a while. Okay. Let's debug. Wait a minute. What does this vinyl button do? My goodness, those were incredible. Um, are these guys uh, engineers or content creators? I cannot believe the production values of those. Um, so we're going to move into the in-person segment now of the Lightning Talks. Um, so first up, I'd like to introduce Igor to the stage, who is going to be talking about democratizing video QC in the browser. Welcome, Igor. I'm not sure how you top those produce videos, but I got, I got a clicker, right? Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Demux, for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Igor Vesmar from Construct, and I'm here to tell you the story about the Makaza player. Well, as any story, there is a protagonist. In our case, it was a client in need. Uh, happened to have to QC 10,000 title catalog in eight weeks with four people that had a day job. Uh, there's a plot, problem to be solved in uh, four months. It was a conflict. Should it be general solution or a custom solution? But unlike stories that make it to the big screen, in the theaters, no villains and no heroes, at least not for now. 
So what is Omakase Player? It is a uh, open source under Apache license JavaScript framework for developing or building frame accurate video experiences. So let me show it to you. Let's see if this works. Okay, here we go. This is a refer this is a reference implementation of the of the framework. The media is being served simply from S3, but any management system you know can do so. From the capability perspective, there is a uh, frame accurate player with a standard you know componentry and functions timeline to which you can visualize audio, video, captions, you know, multiple vi audio, video, and captions, as well as thumbnails, and place the markers uh, time accurately. We also integrated a jog shuttle for efficiency just using a keyboard uh, shuttles. Uh, let's go through a few examples of the use of the Amakaza player. Uh, the one, this is with one of our clients using quality control, called Fast and Furious Quality Control. In addition to the componentry we talked about, you can also see the um, audio router in action here. Another example is using the markers to uh, do the video segmentation or put the points on the timeline, for example, for the ad insertion. The live to odd example is the one of trimming, which is adjusting start and end points of the uh, recorded live feed. Uh, this can be used also to uh, build solutions around creating clips of highlights for the live events. In closing, uh, oh, sorry, final one, almost forget about this one. Uh, this is the use of Makaza player uh, to visualize the real-time video processing. This is kind of the richest experience and the engine behind it is rendering different audio formats as well as, you know, multiple audio and the caption tracks, you know, real-time, you know, on demand. In closing, uh, just if you're wondering why the name of Akaza player, well, Amakaze means in English translation from Japanese to is in trust. And I hope is that uh, contributions to this new open source initiative, you know, can and will entrust the community, you know, to provide this framework for building a frame accurate video experiences. And final thought, uh, love the Meridian, but I don't know what happened with Big Buck Bunny. You know, I wish it was in there, kind of missing it. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm Hannah Teixeira from the Streaming Algorithms team at Netflix. And I'm here today to tell you about our work on using an optimization approach for designing, generating our bitrate ladders. So let me start just explaining a little bit about the problem. As most of you know, uh, we take a long video content and we split it into smaller chunks that we then are gonna be encoding in different resolutions and bit rates. And then we're gonna stitch this variable bit rate chunks back together to, into like thousands of representations for the full video. And then the problem we have our hands now is which of a dozen or so these representations I'm gonna to pick to deploy in our CDNs for our bitrate letters. This is a pretty challenging problem because you sort of have containing goals of maximizing QoE while minimizing the CDN storage and network utilization. And to make matters worse, although we can kind of like know at ladder construction time the storage costs, it's very hard for us to know QoE and network utilization before deploying the ladder. So that's where our NILO comes in. NILO stands for Nested Iterative Ladder Optimization. And what we are doing is we are leveraging interlinear programming in order to optimize for proxy QoE metrics. These are sort of well behaved mathematically. And then we tune the hyperparameters for this ILP optimization using Bayesian optimization. Bayesian optimization allows us to optimize for empirical metrics of QoE and network utilization. And those, like we can use um, metrics of the distribution of network throughput to get expected QoE or even metrics from simulations. And so going through this iterative multiple times, we get a collection of bitrate ladders that we can then explore, get this optimal trade-off. So this is an example of uh, using Nilo in a single title. And you can kind of see that you know, each point here is one full bitrate ladder for this title. And we get the storage, I'm showing the storage and expected quality trade-off here. 
And what you can see is that Nilo get, gets this sort of optimal trade-off of ladders, and it is up to us to decide where we want to be in this trade-off. But you can see already that there is like a large a number of ladders here that's really high quality with substantially storage difference. So there's a lot of really good potential to gain into CDN uh, utilization. So that's all I have for you today. I'd really love to talk to anybody. If you have questions, please find me on the break. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. Um, so next we have Kieran. Um, it's day two, second talk for Kieran, um, talking about the long-term sustainability of open source media projects. Right, yeah, you saw me yesterday, and hopefully I'll get to continue a bit more on this topic. Uh, a much more serious presentation this time. Um, so yeah, the long-term sustainability of open source uh, media projects. Let's use FFmpeg as an example. Uh, most of you probably know it powers all online video, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have great fans uh, like John Carmack, a uh, big supporter of our work. And one of the things he says is it's valuable for the broader industry, what we do, and a triumph for high quality open source software. Well, what happens if we're maybe too triumphant and a victim of our own success? And I thought a picture would speak a thousand words here. And I'll let you digest this a little bit here. This is uh, someone, an engineer from a well-known collaboration suite from a trillion dollar company opening a high priority ticket on a bug tracker full of volunteers. And this isn't fake, right? This is the real deal, you can go look this up. Um, these volunteers actually helped this person and we thought maybe we should ask this you know, trillion dollar company for an SLA of some sort because that's what they would do, right? And they were very, very kind to offer an SLA with one unfortunate problem. The amount was probably less than I spent on my last vacation. And this is, well, a massive, massive problem. And I'll let this all just sink in for a few seconds if we've got a bit more time. A little read of this, you know, asking volunteers to fix urgent issues. Obviously, XKCD got there first, like with everything. Um, so the state of play. Um, Bounties and paying for features does not fund long-term maintenance. This is not a new problem. Many companies in the room hire full-time developers to maintain parts of the Linux kernel. This is business critical. A lot of people in this room work for businesses that would not exist if it wasn't for open source multimedia. You know, paying RealPlayer, paying Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, may, may make the majority of the business models in this room not work. And we have a problem, like I mentioned yesterday, um, Multimedia is not cool anymore. Uh, we have no, no new blood. They all go into AI and ML. And the older generation have bills to pay, kids, etc. It's a big problem. So here's the call to action. Um, pay your developers in-house to work on maintenance. Maintenance doesn't just happen by magic. Um, or hire FFmpeg developers, or get an SLA via FF Labs. Otherwise, well, it, things will just still work. Well, what's in it for me? Well, you'll lose out otherwise. And don't think, don't think you won't, mark my words. No new features, lots of new codecs, HEIF, LCEVC that need complex refactoring, multi-threading, releases, security. These things don't happen by magic. People will go away, mark my words in a few years, look at the average age, and this is a long-term existential crisis that we need to deal with as an industry. And Thanks, Kieran. Um, next, we have Andrew, who is going to be talking about parallel segment downloads for JIT VOD encoding. JIT, just in time. Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, hey, so I am, uh, I'm at Frame.io, an Adobe company. So reasons for our investigation into parallel segment downloads. Uh, our content is kind of weird. It's short. It's for review of pre- and post-production kind of uh, high-quality media from you know, people making TV shows, commercials, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, generally, it's under two minutes long, a lot of times 10 to 30 seconds. Uh, the users like to get in there, click to where they want to go, look at the thing, leave a comment, move on. Some of this content, especially the higher end, higher quality stuff, has just-in-time content protection like watermark ID, which is a visual watermark, or forensic watermarking, which is imperceptible and we can, uh, you know, find you if you leak it. Um, we have two-second segment uh, 
target durations for reasons, a lot of which are now uh, less relevant. And, uh, and we found hardware encoding limitations uh, in EC2. NVIDIA hardware encoding was really slow to start up, and we found it's you know, pretty, a little bit lower quality than software, uh, which is something that we're, uh, we're really invested in the visual quality. So that's kind of what it looks like when you do a watermark ID plus a forensic watermark. It's a little bit slow to start. We got to get those segments going. Uh, and, you know, waterfall here for 1080 with watermark ID, and you see the two second segment target durations. We're kind of already past our budget for that, just doing the re encode in the server that's uh, processing it. The delivery time's acceptable. Uh, so when we go to 2160, uh, it's even worse 3.3 seconds to encode a two second uh, segment, uh, and then a little bit of time to deliver. So we're looking for options. Uh, some, some timing charts, this is kind of, you see the, the, the buffering points here, but what if we do parallel segment requests? So in this model, we kind of stagger it so that we don't want the data transfer uh, buckets to overlap. Uh, it's a little bit more complex. You kind of guess at where you should start. Uh, maybe we do a maximum amount of those rather than just infinite number of parallel requests. So that's that. Uh, what if we don't stagger it? Now we have, um, it's much simpler, but the data transfer is overlapping and that might impact uh, how we view uh, you know, adjustable bitrate. So we're using HLSJS uh, for all this playback. Uh, we built a, a custom fragment loader that calls a custom uh, scheduler. Uh, enabling that in HLS once you've got the functionality built is pretty easy. You just specify the loader. Uh, and Theoretically, could have had a live demo of this, but I don't think Wi-Fi would have played along. So this is screenshots from uh, a while back. Uh, the above is without the custom loader, and the below is with. And you can see here, uh, these segments uh, one, two, three are coming in at the same time. Then as soon as the first one finishes, segment four starts downloading, and we're actually able to do 4K uh, forensic and visual watermark. Why don't we do this? There's a lot of reasons. It clobbers your AVR logic slower time to first frame, which is something our customers are really sensitive about. Seeking is terrible. Maybe there's better solutions, uh, encoding faster, uh, next object requests, uh, et cetera. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Now we have John, who is going to tell us all about that time I, he built a hologram machine. So uh, a few years ago, I was really burned out and I bought myself a toy, which is one of these displays is called a looking glass. Um, and it works kind of like uh, these playing cards, right? It's a lenticular lens array on top of an LCD. And what happens is, is that when you get up really close, it magnifies the uh, subpixels and you get parallax and you can sort of, it's like looking through a glass, looking glass, good name. Um, and uh, so I threw up my first, uh, I threw up my drone and took a picture of the bridge near me and I thought that was cool. Um, I uh, spent some time and uh, d uh, got, got the pictures of, pictures of my family and everything, and I was like, great. And then I thought, what about video? I really, really wish these things could move. Um, and by the way, when, it, when you get the, when you get the uh, data from the, from the device, you're able to do all this kind of stuff. Um, so I did the sensible thing, and I bought a bunch of GoPros, which didn't work. So I did the next sensible thing, and I bought uh, 50 Google Pixel 3s. Uh, and started ripping them apart. And uh, I took the cameras out and uh, 3D printed mounts and uh, fabbed cables uh, and uh, figured out power and uh, plugged them in through USB-C gigabit adapters so that I could have a backplane made out of Netgear hubs. Um, and uh, yeah, basically put them all in a line and try to mount them as rigidly as possible. Um, so this, 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 took a, this took a while. Um, <laughs> But because uh, uh, yeah, it turns out that there's a lot of there's a lot of minutia when you're doing this, um, uh, and you can see I have the fans there because uh, heating becomes heat heat dissipation becomes a problem when you have that many phones next to each other, um, and uh, and I had to do all sorts of stuff under the covers to synchronize the frames because it turns out that Android doesn't really give you tight control over exactly when you want frame times to work. So why not? I'll write an NTP server that runs on the center phone, synchronize the clocks, and then start them again and again and again and again and again until they're in phase. Um, and it worked. Uh, so I was able, the output uh, goes on, I'm able to decode, uh, you know, 42 um, uh, 20 megabit 720p frames, or, or video streams that are HEVC coming off the phones uh, using my M1 Max laptop, this laptop. Uh, and uh, 
then uh, encode also in real time to uh, 8K's worth of pixels, that's HAVC, and then uh, reconstruct it in WebGL in the browser and do stuff like this. And, and anyway, it works on a Quest 2 if, right, that's localhost, but if you go to pinball.pizza in your browser, it'll load and you can try it. Um, awesome. Next up we have a double act. It's TY and Amy, not me, a different Amy, um, talking about turbocharging A-B tests with simulations. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm T.Y. And uh, together with my amazing intern, Amy, we are going to talk about how we leverage simulations to accelerate our algorithm designs. And Netflix, we love A-B test. And the reason for that is because it provides diverse conditions and real data for us to validate our ideas. And this is usually how it works. Uh, we allocate two groups of, uh, of sessions. For each one of them, we apply shiny new ideas, and the other with well-proven production algorithms. And then we deploy them, collect data, analyze it, and iterate from there. And there is randomness involved in this process. And randomness here is a blessing, but also a curse. When our algorithm does not perform as expected, it's really hard to pinpoint the exact problems. And also, if that's the case, then we might have user impact, and it can be expensive, and the turnaround time is usually in days, not, uh, if not weeks. And also, AV test is real, so you cannot test hypothetical scenarios. So Amy, what should we do? Yeah, so to address these problems, uh, we created the simulator. So what the simulator does is it allows us to take production playback sessions uh, and essentially simulate them deterministically in some controlled mock environment using whatever provided ABR algorithm. All right, so you can kind of see how you might want to use this with A-B testing. So we can start off with a production playback session, and we'll run the simulator twice on it, once with the current ABR and once with the modified ABR algorithm. So the only difference between these two simulations would be our ABR changes. We'll pull the QE metrics from these simulations, and then we can compare and analyze them as we would with any other A-B test, except this time we've made this whole process deterministic. So we can run our simulator on thousands of playback sessions to get A-B test results. So this ends up addressing the A-B test shortcomings that we discussed earlier. Um, specifically, now we can attribute any QE metric changes that we observe to the uh, ABR changes that we introduced. In addition, no real users are involved, so we have no potential user impact. And we don't need to do a production deployment to test things, so it's a lot cheaper to run. In addition, simulations are much faster to run because we're using a mock timer, so think like computer cycles. Uh, and we're also able to test hypothetical scenarios because we control the mock environment that the simulation runs in. So all this to say, the simulation uh, is not replacing A-B testing. It's very useful. It's here to add or accelerate our idea iteration. Uh, but A-B testing is, you know, at the end of the day, the most important thing still. Um, but yeah, if you want to learn more, uh, come find us. Uh, happy to talk. Thank you. Wow. And just to clarify, Amy's an intern at Netflix. Incredible. Um, next up, we have JP, a, friend, a familiar friendly face here. Um, JP's going to be talking about Montevideo Tech, or Montevideo Tech, um, the summer camp 2024. Hey, everyone. Um, so yeah, today I'm here to once again talk about our summer camp where we video nerds connect and collaborate. So the idea here is to talk about traveling, discovering, and contributing. You heard Nicolas, my, my coworker, this morning talk about what we did last summer with the CMCD. Uh, so I'm JP, I'm uh, one of the organizers of uh, Montevideo Tech Meetup uh, together with Nico over there. And um, we host uh, meetups and mate talks. Mate is what we drink. You saw some downstairs yesterday. Um, and we also host like hackathons. And a couple of years ago, we came up with this idea of why not doing a cultural event in Uruguay, where we live. So I come from Uruguay. It's a small country, South America, next to Brazil and Argentina, 3.5 million people. 
yet we're the main exporter of uh, software per capita in the region. And also we have great connectivity. According to Ookla, we're the fourth in the world in mobile connectivity because we have a uh, nationwide 5G network already. We're also well known for our meat because we have 3.5 cows per person. <laughs> and we are the pioneers in the one laptop per child um, program. So since 2006, every kid gets a laptop in their schools. And, and we're, yeah, transparency and then full democracy, it's also one of the things we stand for. But the most relevant is that our capital is called Montevideo. <laughs> and uh, these are pictures from last year. And, and what's the idea of a summer camp? And this is, so the summer camp idea actually came up from Rudd. So Rudd here is a guy I met uh, from BD Dev. 2021, December, still COVID, in Amsterdam, he texted me. We had only had one coffee in our lives. And he said, hey, I'm here. It's depressing to be alone at home, working from my home. Can I go to Uruguay? We are in South America, so our summer is December to March. Uh, can I travel there and work from your office? Sure, come. And he came in and took it seriously. He stayed for more than four weeks. And then we said, okay. Let's try to do this in a more systematic way. So last year, we had three campers. We had Marco, uh, Gabriel. Uh, so Marco works with uh, Dan Jenkins. Gabriel is from Bitmoving. And Javi was at TouchStream by that time. And they came and stayed a couple of weeks in Uruguay. And we also worked in some coding experiences uh, that Nico previously showed. And I love these that uh, Marco said that uh, it was all about um, connecting through the power of collaboration. So, so if you want to join the adventure and want to come to Uruguay in March, I'm sure you're going to be creating meaningful connections. We're going to be promoting collaborative culture. You can work from our offices. I can say they're not as great as the San Francisco offices, but probably cozy and also probably a different culture. And, and a, a good way to give back to the community. Got to go. So if you want to know about it, just to catch it up, talk to Nico about the coding experience, talk to the other Nico, Womi or myself, we're here around, and hope you can make it to Uruguay in March. See you guys. Thank you, JP. Um, so next up we have Zoe, who's going to be talking about AV1 SCC, ultra low latency for virtual desktop sharing and browser data security. Blimey, these titles are testing me. All right, so uh, this is Zoe from Renular. I just take the time because uh, today we're going to talk about AV1 for screen content coding, ICC. And uh, I think everybody knows that AV1 is short of Alliance of Open Media Video Codec 1. And right now, this is uh, updated members that uh, has both founding members and promoters. And inside AV1, there's more than 100 new coding tools. And today, we just want to focus on the screen content coding tools. We all know that screen content is very different because look at this slide. If you see the background, it's white, it's everywhere, exactly the same white color, but you look at the walls because of lighting, because of noise, you won't be able to see the same pixel. So definitely AV1 needs, and it has the dedicated and unique sets of coding tools addressing the encoding of screen content. So how do we leverage that? I just want to give you an example. Here we first use uh, the X24, which is the FMPEG 24 to encode screen content. And we use one video clip that has been used mainly by AOM called the Wikipedia. And uh, we encode a 722 count, 720p content for 2C4 at 800 clips per second. And here's another one. We use AV1 to encode at about 20%, which is 170 kilobits per second. So here's the demo that I want to show. Now you can see this is a 2C4 result at 800 kilobits per second. 720p. All right, it's a 20 second. Now we can see that. 
This is the AV1 result encoded at 170 kilobits per second. All right, so back to the slides for the screenshot. So you basically see that 800K, 170K. So what about the speed? Everybody would say that, oh, what about AV1? So we just use a, this data to manifest that AV1 can be really encoded fast enough to address the real-time extremely low delay without the use of B frame. So then the delay would be just encoding one frame. And then what is the encoding time for one frame? So we gave two examples. This one is just for Mac mini, uh, the ARM machine that we actually encode not 720p, but the 1080p content. So you can see that this is used our encoder AV1 that it shows it has different speed level, but for the fastest speed level that we use for today's demo, you can see the uh, actually slowest is still 80%, 80 frame per second, 1080p. On iPhone 12, one last number, <laughs> the slowest is 60 frame per second using one CPU core. And so you can see that there's a great potential for AV1 for virtual desktop sharing and inside the browser that you can just use the video encoded instead of real data to be potentially maybe stolen by other bots. Thank you. Thank you. I'm definitely gonna get fired. I'm not mean enough. I'm like, okay, keep going, keep going. Um, next, we have JB, the man with the best hat in the room, um, is gonna be talking about FFmpeg and related open source projects update. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, this is a usual talk I do every year for the last four years, uh, except this one for this year is uh, going to be a lightning talk. So the usual update for the open source multimedia community, session 2023. Um, so those who don't know me, I'm the president of VideoLand, I've been working on FFmpeg, X264, David, VLC, and quite a few other libraries that you don't know about but that you use every day, um, and I have consulting companies around those projects. Um, so that's my slide after one year, right? It's like last year I was here, I promised things, and this is what I have to show one year after, right? Um, so we promised uh, FFmpeg 6, it was out uh, with quite a few changes in API. And yes, I'm sorry, it's still going to continue. We're going to break APIs again. Um, but we basically shipped everything that we were going, we said that we were going to see. We still continue this uh, new release schedule, the regular release schedule, and FFmpeg 7 is coming quite soon. On the David front, um, we had quite a few releases this year. I don't know why. Um, oh, yeah, I don't, uh, because we push more assembly, and you've seen how many insanity uh, Ronald and his team has been able to do. Um, so that's what we have, and quite a few things on VLC and other projects. Um, FFmpeg 6, which was out uh, in February, many breakage. The most interesting part was everything related to AV1 hardware encoders and decoders and the new FFTs. Um, a lot of small changes like reconstructing frames, uh, H.274 support, um, and also like a, no, a lot of uh, um, filters, decoders, some stuff like Bonk, APAC, and so on, right? Um, so that was out in uh, February. This release was quite well received and not too many regressions for once. So we were very happy. Um, we haven't done, there is just a few minor release for security, but nothing major since then. So what should you care about? Uh, well, you should care about FFmpeg 7, which let's hope would be January or February, uh, like usual. Um, maybe EVC support, uh, there's most events. Uh, through the next library, we have a VVC decoder coming, which is our own decoder, uh, not VVC DAC. Um, there was large change um, and support of Vulkan video decode, hardware decode, multi-support, multi-OS uh, de hardware decode, a ton of AV1 work, as that's not surprising you. Real Video 6, a patch appears on the mailing list, and none of you knew that this existed. Um, <laughs> Uh, Arib video decoder, so anyone from Asia or, or Brazil should care about that, but mostly a lot of cleanups, uh, thread safety, speeds, lot of modifications, 
but mostly the most important part is the multi-threading of FMPEG-7, the CLI. Right, so the CLI, all of you use it all the time. It's very flexible, absolutely not complex to use. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it's a mess, right? And one of the big problems is that it's not multi-threaded, which is a problem because, for example, when you do an ABR ladder, you're waiting for one encode to finish to go to the next one. Well, it's not exactly that, but that's the idea. So we spend, mostly Anton spent like, I don't know, 700, 800, 900 commits this year to clean all that. And there was a lot of prep work and that was done. So you should click on the link over there and see the VDD talk from Anton, who's explaining what he does. But that means that FFmpeg will be able to provide and have a multi-threaded uh, pipeline. And so a lot of your glue around FFmpeg could die. So that's good. Um, on David, um, as I said, a lot of releases. I think we're mostly done for SSC, for Neon, for AVX2. So the only thing to do is AVX512 and maybe RISC5. A lot of things on VLC, mostly on the hardware decoding for uh, AV1 and super resolution. A lot of things on VLC WASM. We talked about that later. Uh, and quite a few things on VLC Unity, uh, VLC on Unreal, and on iOS. And finally, I have to say that you should look at what's happening on Liplacebo, which is a filter library, a GPU filter library to do anything HDR, tone mapping, and so on. And that's pretty cool. Of course, X264 is not dead. Please continue using it. And thank you, everyone. See you next year. Blimey, that was an update and a half in three minutes, incredible. Um, next up, we have Joron. I definitely haven't pronounced that right, but I've been practicing over there for the last three minutes, so uh, I did my best, I'm sorry. Um, so that we, uh, Joron will be talking about four players in a trench coat managing multi-view. So hello everyone, my name is Jeroen, and I'm here to talk about multi-view. First off, what is multi-view? You can see here multiple uh, angles of the same football game. Uh, there are multiple streams, actually, and they're all playing in their own video elements. Uh, they're playing simultaneously uh, as well. Okay. So some uh, general use cases for it involve esports, sports streaming, concert streaming, any kind of online events with multiple camera phones. OK, so now that we have got that out of the way, let's go over how to implement something like this. There are three steps. The first one would be synchronization. Uh, as I mentioned, we have multiple players playing at the same time. Um, so we want to yeah, get them in sync. Um, so how do we do this? We take one of the underlying players as the reference player and then uh, compare the times of that reference player to all the other players. If they do not align, we can slightly adjust the playback rates of the other players to get them closer together. Um, then uh, the way that we can compare the times uh, kind of depends with what we're working with. So for VODs, we can simply use a current time. For Dash live streams, we can also use a current time because it has like a global timeline. HLS does not, so we need to rely on something else, namely the program daytimes. OK, next step would be bandwidth. Um, as you can see on the graph here, if the amount of players increases, then you can guess what happens to the bandwidth. So we have uh, a few ways to optimize this. One of it would be restricting quality to the player size. Um, as we have multiple players playing at the same screen, it doesn't really make sense to play the highest 4K quality on all of the players. Uh, the second would be we could allow enabling disabling of the views. So if a user would not want to look at a certain view, uh, it's disabled, we don't need to do any fetching for it, improving the bandwidth. Okay. Uh, then the last step that I want to go over is the unified player API. Uh, of course, we want to expose the player information of the multi-view player, um, but how do we do this? Um, kind of depends on the parameter. Uh, so for some, like the current time, we can basically use the value of the reference player underneath directly. While for other values, we kind of want like the minimum or the maximum of all the underlying players. Think of the ready state where uh, if one of the underlying players would stall, we also want to show a buffering icon for uh, the whole multi-view player. Okay, and uh, now that we know everything here, if you add it all together, bit of CSS magic, you can get something like this. So the first layout, everything is nicely in a grid. You can also have focus on one, switch which one is in focus, um, or you can really go nuts and move the uh, players around, resize them, really add a lot of customizability for the viewer. Uh, and that's all the time I have. Thank you. Amazing. So I'm, um, Phil is up next. He just asked me how I was going to introduce him. And I was like, I don't know, last but not least. And he went, no, last and least. So like, OK, you said it, not me. So please welcome Phil back to the stage.
Okay, so I'm gonna really quickly talk through uh, the live streaming architecture and the AV architecture of the DMUX 2023. So uh, this is a production of two parts. There is all this amazing stuff you see in front of us, the speakers, the screens, the massive LED wall behind me, uh, and that's all being built up by Repertoire Productions who have done Honestly, a fantastic job. Uh, I think we should all give them a round of applause for all the hard work they've done on the AV this year. And yeah, they provided video wall, live audio, all the in-room vision mixing you're seeing, uh, all the power that's a generator down there, I didn't know, uh, and some SDI runs for us as well. Uh, we, as DMOX, provided the live stream and the cameras and pretty much vision mix it, and that's kind of about it. Uh, video Village is actually behind the screen. If you haven't noticed, that big curtained off area is actually the video village. So down here we have, obviously, guy running the video wall and the vision mixer for a new room experience. We have all the slides, which seem to be coming off more somehow machines than Justin had last year when he had about 11 laptops piled up. <laughs> um, this time it's on like nice Mac Studios, much more professional. Uh, we've got an audio engineer back here and there's also an audio engineer in the room as well. Uh, and there's a producer you just off the left you can't see. And then on the right, that's actually back of Justin's head who's running the stream at the moment while I'm not sat there. So if it's broken, I'm sorry. You can actually blame Justin. Uh, the stream runs on the world's only RGB video encoder. I don't mean that in terms of the signal, I mean it's got loads of LEDs in it and it lights up red, blue, and green. A Blackmagic capture card, OBS with like seven scenes, nothing fancy, a focus right, which we will come back to, and a couple of stream decks. So honestly, we just drive the whole thing from the stream deck. Um, here is me testing the stream rig in the office. Uh, I don't know, like Saturday, Sunday, something like that. Uh, you'll notice those couple of audio recorders on the desk. Uh, thank you to Meta who lent us those very generously and saved us a bunch of budget. Um, here is said RGB, yeah, video encoder. Um, probably, and that I literally took this 30 seconds ago, so you're thinking, well, why doesn't it have a lid on it? Why doesn't it have a top case on it? Well, it's because the CPU cooler doesn't actually fit in the case. We've had this for two years and we still haven't fixed it. So for 2024, I figured I'm just gonna <laughs> cut a little hole, put a turbo in it, I don't know. <laughs> um, we had a few stream problems, uh, as is tradition at DMUX. The first one was some missing audio. Um, this was an issue, we use a system called Slates because we put live stream through MUX, and uh, we had an issue with it. Um, it didn't quite handle some of the slightly late timestamps that happened. So we're fixing it. I feel bad, that's my product, um, but we are working on it. Uh, then there's some audio artifacts on Tuesday afternoon. This was really interesting. The Focusrite just had a wobble, decided it didn't want to do audio anymore. Um, we unplugged it, plugged it back in. It's been fine since. Of course, inevitably, it's now broken, um, now that I've said that. Next year, we're going to kill Focusrite, and we're just going to embed the audio straight into the SDI feeds instead. Uh, and that means we can just get rid of the Focusrite entirely. Uh, and as I got a text message when I explained this issue, it's always fucking audio. I shall be giving my talk in mime. I don't, I, I couldn't try that. Um, one of the little interesting thing that happened, uh, these cameras, these two black magic cameras here, point at this video wall, obviously. If you don't synchronize your shutter speed and your frame rate with the video wall, you get like rolling shutter effects on the cameras. Um, that's totally fine on the black magic. It's really easy for us to align them. Uh, unfortunately, this is Lumix GX7, which is originally supposed to be sat over there, just as like a wide shot. We don't use it very much if you've watched the stream. Uh, it doesn't have enough manual control to fix that. Uh, so repertoire, let us use their bare black magic as well. So now it's two black magic cameras and we can just set them up the same and you don't get the rolling shutter effect. Here is the wiring diagram, a couple of black magics going into uh, some signal converters, getting everything into SDI, going through those RJs for the recording, and then our Honda Civic OBS RGB video encoder, whatever you want to call it. Um, then we kind of also bring in the video from the venue. Obviously what's going out to this wall goes to a decimator and into us and we've got a deck link that's also recording that. Um, so that like, if anything ever goes down, we've got ISO recordings of everything. We can stitch it back together um, in post if we need to. Then obviously the Scarlet, which go away Scarlet, um, is bringing the audio from their audio mixer as well. But we're also using that to loop the audio back out again that goes downstairs and into the green room. Uh, then a, a HMI out of the RGB video encoder um, into another Blackmagic, which combines, like we have a program out preview monitor, as well as uh, the copy that then goes back into repertoire for them to distribute around venue as well. That's kind of it. Oh, and it's RTMPS into MUX, as is tradition. One day RTMP will die, not today. Uh, if you have any questions, 
ask me in hashtag mug store, just DM me in Slack, and more than happy to share how we build it. And yeah, that's it from me. Thank you.